Now I want to draw your attention to another famous game, Rotlevi Rubinstein. It was played in 1907 and Akiba won a fascinating game with black. Later, the Rubinstein bishop became like a, like a theme. Let's dive in. d4, pawn to the center. d5, another pawn to the center. Knight f3, develop the knight. e6, preparing the development of the bishop. e3, white does the same. It's not the most sharp line for white. White is aiming for equality, I'm guessing, because white is supposedly a weaker player. c5, black puts another pawn in the center, not the center, the center, I mean these eight squares. So black already has two pawns in the center, white is not behind, white also fights for the center. Black develops the, the knight, and white develops the knight, and black develops the knight. Complete symmetry. Many games have been played for this position uh, from now. And now white decides to release the tension with dtx c5, which helps black develop the bishop in one tempo. a3 was played, a6 was played for black, this is, as far as I know, this is not the best move for black. Well, for a simple reason, it doesn't help the development. There were other better options for black. b4, so the problem for white is, white is hesitating with castle. Let's see what happens next. Bishop goes to d6. Black could have kept the bishop on this diagonal, I'm guessing that was the original idea, but there's a very strong wall of pawns here, so black decides to keep the bishop on this diagonal, and you'll see what happens next. Bishop developed to b2 and castle. Black succeeded in castling the king quickly, develop minor pieces and put the pawn in the center. White needed to urgently do the same. I'm guessing Georg or George didn't want to lose a tempo by moving the bishop because after capture, for example, bishop e2, capture, bishop takes, bishop spent two tempos and his opponent's bishop spent one tempo. So maybe he was not happy about that. So he played this sophisticated move, queen d2. It's dangerous to play moves like this. You're not developing a piece. You're not preparing castle white by no means is going into a long side. A better, safer play, uh, way to go was c takes d, e takes d, and just play bishop e2, and the castle is unstoppable. For the record, again, if you want to learn tactics, I welcome you to my other course about tactics, understanding chess tactics. You may wonder why I didn't take on d5. There were two attackers and only one defender, but this is a typical, typical combination, knight takes c5, fails because of knight takes, knight takes d5, apologies, queen takes d5, bishop b4 comes with a check, and then the queen is lost on the next move. All right, back to the game. White played queen d2, and black decided to take a risky approach by sacrificing the central pawn with queen to e7. Apparently, it was justified to eat that pawn. White could have taken this pawn, takes, 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 but this is risky, dangerous approach that seems to work if white is a very sophisticated player. Modern engines, I think, even prefer white. From a human point of view, it was safer to still go bishop e2 and castle. White decides to go bishop d3, so I don't follow the logic of queen d2 then. dc4, bc4, bishop c4, b5, bishop comes back to d3. White lost a tempo on queen d2, white lost a tempo moving bishop back and forth, white is developing pieces and after rook d8, white goes away queen e2 because the x-ray is very dangerous, black goes bishop to b7 and white castles. There's a big problem for white, since white did not develop pieces in the fastest possible way, this bishop was going with d3, c4, three tempos and black spent only two tempos on the same maneuver. White went to d2, which is not a good place for a queen. The queen is vulnerable on open files. I don't think I addressed it previously. You can, we talked about good places for bishops, knights, and rooks. The queen enjoys attacking the king. You'll see in this game how the king can, the queen could be very powerful when it comes to attacking the king. What queen doesn't like is to stand on open files because rooks will attack it. It doesn't like to be in front unless it's attacking the king, because it is vulnerable to the attack. So white lost a tempo moving the queen twice, and lost a tempo moving the bishop three times, actually. 
And now what do we have here? We have very symmetrical position. It, the black's rook is on d8 and it's black to move. Black is two tempos up. And black uses it playing knight e5, opening the monster bishop. Knight takes e5, bishop takes e5. This was not a still a deadly or horrible situation for Rod Levy. All he needed to do sounds very simple in retrospect. Complete the development. So why did develop minor pieces, did develop the queen? The rooks are not participating in the game whatsoever. He should have played rook f to d1. Develop your rook. Develop the rook to open file. My guess is that as he was a sophisticated player, he have seen that the best knight on c3 is under attack and pawn on h2 is under attack. And after queen c7, there were double attack, he loses material. However, if he really knew the, felt the dangers of not developing quickly, he would say, hold on a second, development is really important. Let me continue with rook c1. So this is hypothetical variation that he should have done. Bishop takes h2, that's fine, I take on h1, but now I have a threat on the c file. Black should move the queen, for example, to b8, and now white already have some compensation because it's white to move all the pieces in the game and white can make use of it tactically. Surprising tactic, bishop takes h7, knight takes h7, rook takes d8, queen takes d8 and king takes that bishop. And now we're even and white is fine. So what did Rod Levy need to, to, to say to himself? I am very behind in development. It's, I need to do it as fast as possible. I have no time for anything else. I should do it now. And I would support it with, with calculation. Granted, this was not an easy calculation. Let's get back to the game. In this position, he went on to play f4. Technically, he's putting a pawn in the center. Technically. But the fight for the center should be right in the beginning of the game. Then you should develop pieces and castle. He neglected the development. Black moves the bishop to c7 and now again, 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 he should have developed the rook. He has two rooks that are doing nothing in this position. He should have played rook a to d1, rook to open file. He's, he is worse, but not to a big degree. White can, can survive here. White has all the pieces in the game. That's fine. He should have developed the rook. Instead, he went on to conquer the center. Really bad timing really bad timing to do that. White loses this game because white cannot make use of 10 pawns in his army. I mean the two rooks. Take a look how Rubinstein uses it in perfect fashion. Rook to c8, completing the development, two rooks on open files. Amazing. e5, well white sticks to the premise that I'm gonna get the center Development now is much more valuable than the center. You need the center to complete the development, to have room behind the pawns, not for the center, it's, uh, for center's sake. The center is a tool to develop your pieces and castle. It's not the goal. Bishop went to b6, that's a check. King goes to h1. Now jump, knight jumps to g4 and black can afford to do that. Because it seems that knight is attacked, but queen is busy protecting the bishop. So if white takes here, black can take the bishop. And those bishops are monsters. And white can penetrate with the, with the rooks on open file. Rooks are perfectly placed in, the in two open files. Bishops are perfectly placed, placed, crushing the center and attacking the king. So white decides to go bishop e4 to loosen up black's attack. It's too late to do any development. Queen h4 mate in one threat g3 happened in the game you may wonder why why didn't play h3 well there are multiple reasons one of them well h3 was a little better i would say but rook takes c3 would still decide bishop takes bishop takes e4 queen takes e4 and see how the queen is amazing queen g3 comes to threaten mate and if white takes a knight queen simply comes back to h4 and that's a checkmate this is one of the beautiful variations that could have happened. Instead, Rotlevi played g3, which is like horrible when the dead bishop is alive. And now the brilliant combination by Akiba. Rook takes c3, take my queen, I do not care. So why does it? 
Rook to d2. This is just beautiful, brilliant and amazing. Check it out. Black sacrifices a full queen. All of black's pieces are in the attack. Look at this rook on a1. Zero participation. Rook on f1, close to zero participation in the game. Rook to d2. This rook is hanging. This rook is hanging. Why on earth is this working? Queen took the rook. Bishop takes e4. This is called Rubinstein bishops. Couple of bishops entered the king. If diagonals are open, they can crush even without queens and rooks. In enjoy. Bishop takes e4. Check. What do you do? King cannot move. You have to cover yourself with the queen. And now this isn't checkers. Rook takes quiet move. Rook h3. And there's no defense from rook takes h2. There's a pin here. The game could have continued. Queen takes the bishop. And now checkmate. Perfect checkmate. No unnecessary pieces. There is no defense from rook to h2. So I think this is the most famous position. Rook to d2. This is what they put as a screenshot of an amazing game that Akiba played. But if you look deeper, why did it happen? Imagine for a second this rook was here or here. It would never have happened. The rook is fully participating on an open file. White neglected the rule of developing the pieces. Instead, white focused on the center for the sake of the center. Development, development, development. Center, development, castle. The devil is in detail. So technically, white fought for the center and castled king. No. White neglected the fast development as fast as possible. And I'm going to wrap up this subchapter about development with a famous game, with a famous game, Anderson Kizeritsky. I think it's called Immortal Game. It's very difficult to comprehend. Uh, there are lots of tactical ideas. We're just going to ignore most of them because this is not the point of our video. I'll see you in the next video.